fact that there are different religions has, has led lots of people to think that no religion is true, right? That's, that's kind of a, how, you know, everyone's disagreed, so it's, you know, everything's so murky in religious matters, so nothing is true. Huh? Or, you know, people think, well, religions all are basically about the same message, like, you know, love one another sort of thing, and that's pretty much the message, and all religions are the same. Right? So you get basically those two positions kind of out there where you've just got nothing's true in any religion or, you know, every, every religion is basically the same. It's just about kind of a moral code that we live by so we can live together well in this life or something like that. And, um, I mean, early on, even as a young person, I remember hearing things like that and thinking about that. I didn't find them particularly convincing. Um, there are a few things that right off the bat strike you. The first thing is, everyone has a natural desire to be perfectly happy. And I always say, happiness with a time limit is not happiness. No such thing. And everyone knows they're going to die. So you know that it, it is impossible, in principle, to be happy if all there is is this life. And yet, <clears throat> we can't know from reason alone, from just our experience of this world, we can't know everything about the next life and, and how happiness might happen in the next life. So therefore, it, it's, it was obvious to me early on, even as a young person, there has to be an actually revealed religion if happiness is possible, okay? There has to be something that God actually has to exist. He has to reveal something. And not only that, but if it is really God, then it's got to be a lot bigger than the human mind. If it's a religion where you can understand everything perfectly, that's not from God because it's really just a human invention. So I knew right away, if you're looking for truth, and authentic happiness. And you have a natural desire for this happiness. It seems impossible to me that someone could have a natural desire for something that's in principle impossible. So putting those two things together, I said, well, what are the criteria that you would use in order to identify of all of these religions, which one would you be able to identify as true, right? Well, there's a couple things. Number one, it can't contradict what you know to be true from, from reason, you know, right reason, okay? So if someone tells you that, you know, black is white and white is black or something like that, you say, no, sorry, that's not a good religion. Or if it contradicts itself, right? Um, or if it says things that are obviously contrary to what can be known from reason, right? Someone tells you, you know, like the moon is made out of green cheese, that's our religion or whatever. I don't know, right? Um, so you have to sort of rule out those religions. But then you also have to rule out things that are just clearly human inventions. Um, for example, if you've got a religion <clears throat> and like its main tenets are things like, well, when you die, you get like lots of alcohol and girls. <laughs> I say to myself, like, that can't be from God. That just can't be from God. That's just, you know, it's living a life of just totally gratifying the senses and not having a higher life, you know. So you look at the fact that not only does it is it consonant with reason and doesn't contradict to re true reason? But it also, in some ways, satisfies the deeper longings of the human heart in surprising ways that you wouldn't guess, that wouldn't be the sort of thing you could guess, and then just suddenly like, wow, that answers the question, you know? I'll give us a, a couple simple examples. You know, in philosophy, there was this big dispute between Aristotle and Plato about morality, huh? And the question was, who should we follow as a moral example, right? Um, Plato said, look, the perfect is a measure of the imperfect. So the one to be followed in the moral life is, is one who's perfect. But the problem is that no man is perfect, only God is perfect, and he can't be seen. And so Plato was saying, you know, stuff like, well, yeah, you, you have to follow God. That's the measure of, of human virtue is, is the divine. But you can't see God. He can't give you an example. Aristotle is being a little bit more practical, and he says, well, the measure is homogenous with the measured, meaning like you, you measure a length by a length, you know, you measure an area by an area. So you have to have the same kind of thing that's involved when you're measuring something. So in your moral life, the measure of man's moral life has to be another man. And therefore, Aristotle says the virtuous man is a, is a measure. But the problem is there that no man is perfectly virtuous, so man can be seen but can't be followed. And Plato said, God is to be followed, but he can't be seen. You have this problem in philosophy. And then Jesus Christ comes, and God became man. It's a surprising 
resolution to this perennial philosophical moral problem, right? So things like that, and you find that everywhere in the Christian religion, where there's a philosophical problem that doesn't have a philosophical solution, and then Revelation perfectly answers it. Um, it's, it's things like that that actually point you to the Christian faith and you say, yeah, that, does, that has all the hallmarks of a revealed truth that no human mind could come up with and, and it satisfies the deepest longings of the human heart at the same time.